Well, the silence is getting to me, so I think we'll start. My name's Bill Manning. I work with the LLS of Gunnedah in uh, cropping. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everybody and thank you for attending. I would also like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Kamilaroi people in my case, and probably others in other people's cases. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. Um, a few little reminders. This uh, webinar is being recorded and will be used as evidence against you. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we'd ask you to put them in the chat box. Uh, we found that's been working the best in the last few webinars. And also that the university is looking to find out any topics of interest that are not covered in these webinars. So um, if there are areas that are not being explored that you think are worthy of exploration, you could mention that in the chat box. Uh, there is also at the end of this webinar, like most extension events nowadays, there's a short questionnaire at the end. And I ask you to fill that out because um, that helps greatly with our reporting of these events to the people that fund us. Uh, without any uh, further ado, I'll introduce Mitch Kuehl, who is, in his own words, a good bloke. Uh, he works with Outlook Ag. They offer agronomy and uh, precision ag services. And he's going to talk today about his take on Precision Ag. So I'll hand over to you, Mitch. Uh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Thanks, Bill. Cheers, mate. Um, good day, everyone. I'll just share my screen here so we can all see it. Very good. Thanks for having me today on the uh, DigiFarm Expo. Um, so I work for Outlook Ag here in Narrabri. Um, for the, those of you who don't know, Outlook Ag is a um, consulting agronomy company um, based in um, the, the areas there I've got circled in the map. So Liverpool Plains, Narrabri Balada, and west around the, the Walgut Shire. Uh, we cover 300,000 hectares of cropper, cropping, winter and summer, dry land and irrigation. So um, there's about 12 of us on team. Um, all, in, all across those areas and um, yeah, we've come together and um, yeah, share a lot of ideas and, and IP and um, yeah, just um, together we, we also do a bit of research and um, you know, trying those new ideas. So today's Prezzo, um, I've been asked to give a bit of a snapshot of um, ag tech in practice. So what we're doing in the field as agronomists, um, also what our growers are doing and I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit of a, a spiel on what what we think um, future tech needs to hold for us um, what we see as the important issues um, that, that need to be addressed now um, so um, Fiona presented on Tuesday um, just a, a bit of a snapshot on the um, precision ag front of, um, of what we're doing in the paddock and um, you know just a bit of a basic a basic in intro to PA. Um, of, I'll sort of continue on from what what she was presenting and just go into a little bit more depth of what um, we're using and what we're doing in the paddock. Um, so uh, we've we've um, offering a PA platform now through Outlook Ag um, through PCT, um, and we've we sort of rented out around our our narrow bribe ladder Edgeroy area. Um, to start off with, and we've had uh, quite good grower uptake. Um, we started off pretty basic. So as most people may know, you know, we're collecting yield, yield mapping. Um, we're doing variable rate fertilizer, seed, chemical, um, collating um, ele elevation data, um, which we're finding is um, quite a good, uh, good tool, um, you know, for frost, water movement. Um, and we find that quite critical in our system. Um, and of course, the, uh, the satellite imagery, which um, most people are on these days, and and it's a great in inspection tool and ground truthing of um, you know what what your crops looking like um, from above. Um, some pros with with precision ag, um, pros and cons. So you know the pros are we, we can take a very targeted approach 
um, in our under underperforming areas um, in in most paddocks if we've got that data available you know to save more money and, and gain more money at the end of the day um, and we find you know in the, in the high yielding years we, we even see that variability within a paddock which we show there and you know that the main aim of precision ag is to get get that even paddock and and try and bring those those um, underperforming areas up to a, a level of standard and and you know to to produce what it, what its potential really could be. Um, one of the biggest cons we, we have um, out here, um, and, and it probably goes most regional Australia really is is connectivity. So um, you know your 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 four G your three G network, um, a lot of these apps and um, satellite imagery data that we try to do in the field is is a bit of a challenge from day to day. Changes every day. Um, so that's our biggest sort of limitation with with rolling PA out in the paddock. Um, we find as a group, we you know we, we sort of downloading maps and and the data um, under Wi-Fi before we head out into the into the paddock. Um, but yeah, that's probably our biggest limitation. One of the biggest limitations with PA for us is the connectivity. But you know, like I said in pre previous um, webinars. Uh, earlier in the in the week, you know, the, talking about the LoRaWAN network and, and those sort of things. So the work's being done. We're just um you know, we're just waiting patiently to be able to um to run this stuff out in the paddock. Um, so I'll just give a bit of a snapshot, you know, of what um just a basic snapshot of what what we're doing with some growers. Um, some of this, you know, is probably pretty old, been done in the past, but we're just sort of uh, demonstrating how we're analysing this sort of data. Um, in the paddock. So this one's probably been around for a long time, particularly down south, but in our area, we don't, not, don't have a big pH effect in our black soils, but um, this is a farm just north of Balada. Um, in 2019, we had a barley crop in this particular paddock. Um, and you know, from the, the yield map and um, ground truthing, knowing the soil type, soil testing, um, we had an acidity issue, which you can see in this. I'll just turn my pointer on um, so you guys can see. So in this, um, in these sort of brown spots, green spots, uh, yeah, lower pHs. So sitting around that um, four to four and a half um, and, you know, four and a half to five in the brown spots. So from that yield map, we thought, righto, oh, well, let's create a VR map um, of lime and try and bring these up to spec. So this, the line was applied in the beginning of 2021. So we had a chickpea crop in between the 2019 and the 2021 crop. Um, and we just, we wanted to, the 2019 crop was a, a wheat, a bread wheat. So we just wanted to show bread wheat like for like in the rotation. Um, so this data is sort of showing us that this light green bar that's the 2019 crop. So we can see the, the fall across that variable rate map. Um, like the two, two and a half is the, the green and the blue area, 1500 is the orange area. So you can see that yield decrease in the 2019 crop. We've applied the line start at 21, and you can see across the same VR map how we're bringing these sections up. So this is just a tool to demonstrate, you know, we're collecting this data. Um, and, and, you know, showing it to the grower that, you know, what, what we're actually doing is working and, and, and making them the money, making their money back over that time. So, you know, we, we'll follow this over the next five years and see how much bang for buck the, the limes made us. Um, so that's just one example. Same farm, um, also looking at acidic soil um, where we thought, where we haven't done lime, can we, um, in the acidic patches, we always find our, plant death, plant mortality rates quite high at seeding. Um, so we, we never established the, the, the plant population to get through. So we, we sort of thought, well, let's increase our seeding rate in this acidic area, which on this map, if you can see my laser, laser pointer there in the green, that's all the acidity area. So we, this is canola. Um, we've just sown it um, three kilos in the heavy area, two kilos on the black soil, which is the red here. Um, so pretty much I ground truth this when we, oh, this map was put into the, into the tractor um, through the screen and the, 
the um, seed cart was VRing through this through this paddock, and we're able to um, ground truth that um, with establishment counts. Um, you know, we established quite a um, obviously a higher population, and and as the season went on, we started to lose plants to that um, aluminium toxicity and, and plant death due to the the acidity acidity of the soil, um, and we. Um, we're able to have a few survivors, which which um, brought through to yield. Uh, fortunately, in this particular trial, we didn't have a, a like a, a control treatment. Um, but from from the data here, um, oh, well, this is also just to explain quickly that that map there is a, a landscape change, so just an elevation map. So we just analysed the data by elevation, which is um, what these numbers are. So obviously, the the yellow being the uh, the red being the low spot, yellow being the, the sort of flatter, um, more even, and then the, the um, green being the slope. So we just looked at the different yields and you can sort of see the effect of, um, you know, where we had these acidity spots, the drop in yield. Um, not having the control there, I know, is sort of not, not um, great data practice, but from history of what we've seen in this paddock and over time, you know, we would have, we would have expected to see the yield Way, way down on these um, acidity patches. So that's just another tool we're using. Um, 2021, last year, quite a wet year. Um, a, lot of, a lot of growers, our growers would have came across this same Picasso painting of an NDVI image. We um, you know, waterlogged areas, low spots. Um, so, so last year was the perfect fit for NDVI based in a variable rate map because ground truthing that NDVI was quite simple. You know, you come to these areas here, these greener areas, um, you could straight away tell, yep, it's waterlogged, lacking N. That area, the paddock's living on the surface, um, roots aren't getting down. Um, so when we sort of started to dry up a bit and the roots got down, um, we thought, well, let's create a, a VR urea map. Pretty basic um, and, you know, from this NDVI, we created this, this um, urea map, um, 50 kilos in the red, 150 in the blue. And then um, this is the yield map here, which I'll explain a bit now that the northern half of this field was um, harvested after the big rain events. So we sort of take that out of the equation at the moment because that's all water damage. But I just want to point out these little patches here in the yield map, the blue, where we've actually increased that um, or brought the crop back and we've, we've probably established a higher yield with that, um, with that increase of urea. Like I said, variable rate urea is different year to year. You know, a um, lot of targeted grid soil sampling is needed. Last year, we were probably, it was easy to ground truth um, um, these maps with, with what we were seeing in the paddock. Uh, another one I want to point out is, as I said before, we, we see a lot of variability in our yield maps um, from year to year, um, last year being quite a high yielding year. So when I was saying on the high end yield where we're still, you know, we're averaging six tonne to the hectare, we're still getting this massive variability in our paddocks. And um, it sort of brings to light when you, when you look at this stuff over time, um, you know, when you look at this map, for, for example, um, a paddock um, that's a road through the centre, so I call that the north of the road, northern end of this paddock. You know, if, if we were to just average that, we would have been, you know, six and a half, seven tonne average on that bread wheat. And then we add this to the paddock, it drags us down. So me knowing this paddock, it's a subsoil constraint on the southern end. So that's a, a really sodic level um, of soil at depth, um, which is which probably typical of Edgeroy Balada west of the highway. Um, from this, so, you know, you look at this, the grower looks at this and thinks, well, how, you know, how can I fix this? So from there, we think, well, we've got a sub, sub soil constraint and this is where we run ideas. And, you know, if you're deep ripping, you're deep banding a fertiliser. Um, one thing we're actually looking at doing in this paddock is a, a trial of deep ripping, however, with um, ameliorants. So looking at deep, trying to deep band some gypsum or more importantly, look at other alternatives such as manure pelletized manure deep banded into that that layer um, to try and bring this level up um, to this level which is um, what I was saying before not only in a high end yield would, would that potentially fix that but 
um, in a lower lower ending yield environment, bring that up as well, the spec. Um, this, Fiona presented this on, on Tuesday, but I, I just thought it was quite important. Um, and I'd just like to share it again, um, given the, the complex we have at the moment of herbicide resistance in the area, particularly on, um, you know, we've got our south thistle, our flea mains, uh, and our grasses, more importantly, we've got three species of grass um, or four species, summer weeds that are, that are quite um, resistant to, to glyphosate. So this is where we used our PA to, to get on top of a problem in this paddock. Um, we had uh, straight out of the drought, so Feb 2020, we had all that rain, water went across this paddock. Four weeks later, just a blowout of Feathertop Roads grass. So um, obviously a pretty, pretty big seed bank. This is just a classic NDVI image, blue being blue and um, you know, green where all the, the feather top patches were. Um, and the black is just, yeah, obviously the bare soil. Um, quite a large paddock, 420 hectares. Now to commercially treat that paddock as the same, um, to control that grass, very expensive. So we thought, let's, let's, let's try something different here and um, run a VR map of herbicide with, a resistant, uh, with um, residual management to try and get on top of this grass in one year. Um, so we, we went on and created a VR map. Um, and, you know, obviously where, where these blue areas are, we want to target that weed um, and, and uh, give it a good soaking in herbicide um, more than what we probably need to in these areas. So we created that. We had a lighter rate on the, on the green, uh, a mid or probably the broad acre rate we would have done on the light blue and then a really heavy rate on the, on the dark blue. Um, you know, on average, when you look at that map, that's the rate we put across the paddock. Um, and, you know, we spent $14.50 a hectare uh, versus a blanket rate cost of $22.50. Um, then coming back with, which was the important one and is with grass, as most people know, the, the, the second knock is critical. Um, so this is where we came back with our paraquat, um, and residuals, so balance and dual gold, where we did a variable rate with that as well. Um, so we had our lighter rate on the, the green and the light blue, a, um, a mid, like probably the label rate, the broad acre rate, and the dark blue, um, just a heavier rate to really get on top of that residual. And um, that's probably where we saved most of the money because residuals, as everyone knows, is quite expensive. Um, and, you know, we halved that that cost, which was a big saving and did a better job because we had a more targeted approach to those weeds. And that's just a picky, Fiona showed the exact same thing the other day, but I just wanted to, to bring it up again and, and show that, you know, I, know, I know a lot of people out here would have this exact same scenario and um, there's tools out there that can then be a bit more economical and probably give, give us a better job at the end of the day. So we can see here um, on, the, on the right, what I was saying before, how we need to double knock out our, our grass species. You can see here, just going straight through those knockdown herbicides, where we've used the variable rate, um, double knock with residuals. Um, yeah, quite a, quite a great job. And, and we're seeing in this paddock now, it's, we're still seeing this carry through. We took out a large seed bank in that paddock and mainly did you um, do with that targeted approach on those really heavy areas. Um, so that's that's the PA space for us. You know, we're working pretty hard. That was some pretty basic data, but um, you know, we're just sort of showing that we can um, now collect that data quite well and um, and start to use it. Um, I'll just quickly run through just some crop, crop, crop monitoring stuff. How am I going for time, Bill? Uh, we're pretty much running out of time. So right up. Yep. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just quickly run through this crop monitoring. Um, I. Uh, we've, we're just using an app at the moment. Most people are aware of um, AgWorld. We've got a scouting app, which we're collecting um, in-crop data with, um, which is um, just used on, on a mobile device. Um, from that, it'll punch out a, um, a CSV file of data of all the, the pests that we're collecting and um, recording and phys um, uh, crop physiology measurements as well. Um, and uh, we punch it into our own little program, which we're um, you know, collecting all this data and reporting back to a grower 
and keeping this data on record for um, you know for more and more seasons. And you know we can punch out graphs um, through the season of of um, farm averages of beneficials. Um, this is obviously in cotton um, cotton retention and and insect numbers. Um, and looking at overlaying this with with probe data, which is out there with um, probes that go in, I have overlaying our data um, with the water data in irrigation, which is you know helping us uh, you know giving us a better understanding of what's going in the crop and what's happening there. Um, so this is just one of the tools that that um, we're using there. And um, sorry to rush through that in the, in the essence of time. Um, uh, thing I mentioned before was the future technology. So you know, some of the issues that we that need to be addressed, um, you know, now we think is the connectivity, particularly moving into the automation space. Um, you know, to be able to run your farm off your off your smart device, you know, we just need that connectivity desperately to, for this to run run smoothly. Um, and like I um, said before, in the with the herbicide stuff, herbicide resistance is is probably one of our biggest issues at the moment, particularly in fallow. Um, so, you know, looking at outside the box sort of thinking of automation, machine learning, um, you know, to help us combat these issues. And I'll leave it at that, Bill. Okay. Sorry to rush you at the end there, but I'm sure Mitch would be happy to talk to anybody offline in the future about what they're doing. Um, yeah, just to, we'll have one quick question there. Somebody's asked, uh, what upload and download speeds do you think you need to make all this work? So that the the upload speed isn't too bad. It's the download speed that gets us, and it's I, I don't know the speeds off the top of my head, but they change every day. Like we can, you know, we we'll, we can't even hold a phone call out in the paddock at the moment. So you know, and it depends on the weather. The wind's blowing hard. You don't get your, your connectivity, so yeah, it's a yeah. it's variability as much as yeah, yep. a, a simple number. Yeah, and everyone knows everyone deals with the same issue out this way. Yep. Okay, then. Um, well, we'll move on to um, James Arnott, who uh, is the manager at Berwick's in the Southern Liverpool Plains. Um, he's been there for quite a long time. Berwick's is a mixed cropping and cattle enterprise. And uh, James is in the process of moving towards precision ag. And uh, he's gonna give us some of his thoughts on consolidating farm data. Okay, James, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any smart presentations, but um, I suppose a bit of background here. Um, Bill said that we're sort of starting on precision agriculture. It's actually, it's a long start. We actually started collecting data in 1995 from yield maps um, and purchased our first uh, variable rate seeding and fertiliser gear capable of, of um, applying variable rate over four bins back in 2000. I set about with a very clear picture in my mind of what I was trying to achieve in that um, um, we have on the, on the very southern edge of the Liverpool Plains, running up onto the range, um, sloping country, um, very different soil profiles across a paddock that might look um, fairly similar from the surface. And so what I, at the outset, um, was trying to come to terms with was, well, what's the plant available water in any one point in that paddock? And we were initially using yield maps only to... Um, to ascertain what was going on in those paddocks and then going out and digging a few holes and finding things out. But it was, um, there were all sorts of issues that we came up with as we embarked upon our variable rate fertiliser program. Back in 2000, we were laying down test strips of phosphorus, sulphur and nitrogen um, across our paddocks and we would get um, responses to those some years and some years no response at all. Some years the um, responses would happen a year, 12 months after laying down the test strips. So we got very confused. I got to the stage where I wasn't sure whether the variability that we were seeing in our yield maps was something that was inherent in the system or something we were causing. 
Um, and so we actually stepped back from it because it wasn't, we weren't gaining anything from, from the variable rate stuff we were doing. Um, and it really, it was confusing us more than anything else. So in recent times, we've, we've gone back to it with a slightly more um, calculated approach using EM surveys uh, and then ground truthing those EM surveys against digging actual holes in the soil, finding out what the soil characterization is through the profile um, and trying then to calculate a, a plant available water for a full profile in any one point in the paddock and working from there. Um, contrary to what some of Mitch's work is where he's trying to um, uh, even his yield map out across the paddock, I suppose in, in some respects, I believe here um, the opposite's true. Probably the worst yielding parts of the paddock, um, in my mind, might be doing all they can. And um, by fertilising them to the same rate as the best parts of the paddock, we're over fertilising those areas. And it's probably the best parts of the paddock, I believe, that are letting us down. So our program is then to try and shift resources from the, um, the poorer soils and concentrate those resources onto the better ones. Um, other issues though that we've had going along um, revolve around collecting and storing data and analyzing that data. We use 100% um, contract harvesters and we've had several different contract harvesters over the years, um, we would normally be running two or three headers at any one time. And um, I suppose the, the big issue has been that the, the, the operators, not necessarily the contractors, aren't sufficiently trained in how the, how the yield monitoring gear in the headers works. Um, quite often we find that um, you'll have a header operating with the stuff not turned on the wrong paddock selected, um, the wrong grower selected. Um, and, and for the last few years, um, virtually none of the data that we've collected has really been useful. The other issues that have been um, coming up is also that you'll get three headers turn up with three different calibrations. If they're working in one paddock and all working side by side, you can fairly easily do a post calibration on that. But when one, heads off to one part of the paddock and does a block, another one heads off to another bit. Um, it's really hard to then um, do that post calibration that makes sense. So we, we are finding that, that um, for the last few years, most of the data from a yield perspective is not really useful. And every time you get this, this happens, um, it, it, you know, <laughs> it's not till the end that you realize that things are going wrong. And I suppose the other thing that happens is that we're all time poor and, and probably don't apply ourselves sufficient care and attention to make sure these things are happening. After last year's wheat harvest, where we, you know, it was particularly, not last year's wheat harvest, the one before, uh, particularly wet year, um, big crops, most of them on the ground, um, so the headers were working virtually on the ground. Come to the next sorghum crop, the height switch settings are all wrong. One header didn't record any data at all um, through, the, through the whole sorghum harvest because the, the front was operating above the height switch setting. So they're all issues that we've had collecting the data and trying to, um, I suppose, get our program on track. Um, Bill's been doing some work with us at the moment regarding plant available water and, and looking at our um, EMs and that sort of stuff to make sure that we get that right. Um, and so we can start painting that three-dimensional picture of the, of the um, yield capacity of our soils across the paddock. And then we, we will start to... Um, do a little bit more with our variable rate applications and following them up with decent yield mapping. We've got a new contractor starting this year and um, I have sufficiently worded him up that um, there will be financial penalties if the data is not usable. Um, I think that covers most of it. I suppose the other issue um, that we've really 
suffered is the old issue with contractors and things is the different languages that everything speaks. Um, our air seeder cart that we bought in 2000 has a farm scan, 3000 unit, was cutting edge stuff at the time we bought it. Still quite a good air seeder cart, but um, having software to actually produce the maps um, to drive the thing is starting to become difficult. We're doing it all through Paddock Action Manager from, from Western Australia, which has worked quite well for us over the years, but they're now moving to a new platform too. Um, and whether, whether that will continue to be supported is gonna be a problem into the future. Um, it's, it's a system that works. Um, we're reluctant to change it, but um, it might be forced upon, it if, upon us if we can no longer um, produce the maps to go into the machine. Um, so there's all those um, sorts of issues that we, we are struggling with. Um, you then get the odd um, computer crash and things and you lose some data because you haven't backed up properly. That all happens. Um, and I'm sure we've all um, been through that at some stage in the past. Nowadays with cloud storage and all that sort of stuff, it's so much easier to protect your data. But that has been a problem in the past. Um, so we, with renewed enthusiasm, we are going back into our our variable rate application. We, in our discussions a week or so ago, are looking at some of those lighter soils or lower water holding soils and actually reducing our plant populations in those soils. Um, one of the reasons we lose yield there is lodging. And so if we can um, prevent a bit of that by lowering our yield, uh, plant population, we expect to lift the yield in those areas. But it is really our better soils deep soils, which we're probably under fertilizing to some degree and, and feel that they can uh, do more for us. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot more I need to say, Bill, unless anyone's got any questions. Um, but yeah, so in practical terms, it's been a long, long time trying to make this work. We're still trying to make it work. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get there in the end. And certainly at the moment, I feel we're getting somewhere. Um, connectivity remains a problem as it does everywhere. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we get around that one. Okay, then what do you think is the ultimate answer with head of contractors? Is it just to make a financial arrangement that makes the data collection? I think, I think the data product? collection has to be part of the contract. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's one of those things, Bill, you know, particularly in a wheat harvest where you need to get the header here and start into the harvest, get it off. It's all rush, rush, rush. And that's the first thing that's forgotten because it's not seen as greatly important by the contractor themselves, who may then have another um, grower waiting for his headers to turn up. Um, the other thing is if there's an issue with the thing, um, a wire gets eaten by a rat or something like that. Um, it doesn't stop the header working, so the the um, operator is inclined to continue, um, but no data has been collected, and 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 so there there needs to be a part in the contract that specifies that this data must be useful. Are you finding they're getting better over the years? Are you no. seeing an improvement or? No, I don't think so. Um, in some ways, it's getting worse. And I suppose it's because all the headers are fitted with the stuff now. A lot of the growers that these guys are servicing don't use it. And so they don't really care. Um, and, and it's not until you apply that financial incentive that it really means anything to the contractor themselves. I'm not trying to demean contractors or anything. They do a very good job at harvesting crops. But this is an important part for us of, of that, because it, it brings, without the yield data, you sort of lose um, track of everything you're doing. And it's very hard to, to um, come to terms with, are you doing the right thing with your fertilizer policy or your seed rate policy and all that sort of stuff um, without having that final check at the end. And, um, and so, yeah, there really needs to be some sort of financial incentive to make that happen or penalty if it doesn't work. Okay, uh, 
on your place, from my experience, a, a lot of the variation seems to be in, in soil depth yes. as much as anything. And I guess that's a little bit different to what some other places uh, very, are dealing with. Very much so. Bill. Soil constraints or acidity. Yes. Yeah. I suppose you could call you could call the soil depth a subsoil constraint, <laughs> but you can't really do much about it if it's rock. <laughs> um, yep. well, one of the one of the other issues, Bill, as you'd know, with it that uh, you know we have some a portion of quite stony soils, and it was um, it was always my thoughts that 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 stone was you know might occupy say 20, 10, 20 percent of the profile. Um, which would reduce the plant available water in that profile. We dug quite a few pits in some of our stonier areas and we're very surprised to find that the majority of those stones were actually laying on the surface and, um, and the, the profile itself wasn't greatly stony. Um, I'm not quite sure how that happens. I mean, my thought process is that um, over millions of years, the soils all washed away and left stones behind. Um, so what we have embarked on doing with the basis of that is actually um, stick pick, uh, stone picking a lot of those stonier soils and uh, uh, make them a little bit easier to operate. Fair enough. Okay. Well, we might leave it there. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat box. So um, we might move on to uh, William Salter, who is a postdoctoral scientist with Sydney University. Um, he works with the weeds unit and uh, he's going to give us an update on the work they're doing. I'll hand over to you, William. Uh, thank you, Bill. I'll just share my screen here. Okay. So yeah, hopefully now you can all see my screen. Um, so yeah, as Bill mentioned, uh, I'm going to give an update on the work we've been doing in the Precision Weed Control Group at Sydney Uni on uh, weed control technology. Um, and before we jump into the future uh, of weed control, I guess I'll uh, sort of set the scene and, and jump back into the past a little bit. Um, so as you're probably aware, weeds pose the biggest threat to yield uh, of all plant pests. Uh, costing the grains industry uh, over $3.3 billion annually. And uh, of course, weeds aren't a new issue. Uh, they've, they've long been a problem. And I guess the uh, big sort of uh, 20th century uh, step change in weed control occurred when, we, when herbicides became widely available. And that really allow, allowed the industry to shift from uh, a tillage-based system to, to more reliance on herbicides to control weeds. Of course, that had benefits uh, to soil moisture and uh, soil uh, nutrition uh, as well, um, but ultimately it, it gave us much better control of weeds on the farm. Uh, moving into, I guess, the present, um, uh, Mitch mentioned in his talk that herbicide resistance is becoming a really big problem. Um, yeah, it's, it's massive, and uh, that's compounded by the fact that uh, there haven't really been any true, uh, new true modes of action of herbicides discovered since the 1990s. Um, so we really need to be thinking outside the box and uh, looking at new technologies that could address this issue of, of weed control on farms. And uh, thankfully, we, we are, uh, to, to, to a degree, already moving uh, in that direction. Uh, in, and that direction is uh, what we refer to as site-specific weed control, uh, where we target individual weeds rather than, uh, say, relying on chemistry or, or blanket spray and a whole fallow um, to, to control the weeds. Um, of course, with that, uh, in just spraying individual weeds, we get big savings in herbicide usage, which saves money, uh, but also has environmental benefits as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're sort of already there. Uh, there are sensors on the market now, like your Weed Seeker, which, which we, uh, I've shown here, um, and, and your Weed Its, uh, which are, are really effective ways of uh, saving herbicides and, and targeting individual weeds in fallow situations. 
Um, however, uh, these are fairly simple sensors. Um, they're basically plant detectors. They detect uh, chlorophyll fluorescence from the plants, and so as a result, they're unable to discriminate between crop and wheat. If you have a plant there, it's uh, it's going to spray. Uh, so for us to really have, I guess, that twenty first century um, step change in weed control, uh, we really think that we need to shift to camera based weed uh, detection technologies. Um, but as with any new technology, there's a few things that will, will make this uh, actually happen. Uh, firstly, research. Um, I guess that's where we come in uh, and also where we uh, we work with other groups to, 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 make, the, to make the technology advance. Uh, but that really needs to happen with uh, engagement from growers uh, and the agricultural community and, uh, and also educating the, the growers and uh, the wider community as well. Uh, for, so really, they're, they're the three things that we think really need to happen for, for camera-based weed detection to take off. Um, and, and I guess, so that will allow us to shift to uh, in-crop site-specific weed control, where we can spray individual weed plants uh, in, in when a crop is also present in the field. And so that begged the question uh, for us, uh, whether we could develop an open source camera based uh, site specific weed control platform uh, for both education and community led development. Um, and my, uh, my colleague back in, uh, I guess, at the end of 2020, uh, decided to, uh, in his spare time, build uh, what he referred to at that time as uh, the open spot sprayer. Um, and, and at this point, we sort of saw this as a real opportunity. And, and so that's where I came in and, and we worked together to develop it further into uh, the, uh, what we renamed the Open Weed Locator or, uh, or, or OWL. Um, and we designed this to be a low cost, open source, uh, build it yourself, uh, optical uh, device for, uh, for education and research development purposes. Um, we, uh, we, we built it using a fairly cheap componentry. Um, we, we based it all around a Raspberry Pi uh, single board computer, uh, which was actually originally developed for uh, teaching kids how to code. Um, however, uh, it's, it's a fantastic tool because there's lots of resources out there online uh, for, for us to do uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful things with it. And the beautiful, uh, beautiful the best thing about it is that it only costs about hundred dollars to buy. Uh, coupled to that, we we used a, a Raspberry Pi high quality camera, which uh, costs about one hundred and fifty dollars, and then we had a, a cheap relay board that allows us to connect it to uh, downstream weed control devices. Um, in in our case, we've been using uh, solenoid nozzles uh, to to test the system. Um, we also relied pretty extensively on a 3D printer, and so we have a 3D printed enclosure, uh, 3D printed parts within inside the uh, enclosure itself, and uh, we even went as far as 3D printing the uh, mounts for the solenoids on the boom as well. Um, and uh, and we have just published this paper uh, in scientific reports on on what we're what we were we we're referring to as version one of the owl, and so if you'd like to check that out, I'm sure we're all quite familiar with QR codes uh, now. So you're very welcome to scan that there. Um, in terms of how it works, uh, we took a very uh, we we wanted to make sure that both the hardware and software were modular in nature, uh, so that users of the system could customize it and uh, themselves and and also develop it further to their own needs. Um, the way it works, uh, we we take a video frame from the camera uh, and and run an algorithm over that. Um, in this first first instance, uh, and in the paper, we were kind of just trying to replicate uh, the functionality of of your weed seekers and weed it um, by detecting green pixels within the frame, um, and and if it detects green pixels, that is then passed. Uh, that is counted as a, a weed detection. Um, it's uh, allocated to one of four zones, which span the uh, the, the frame of the video. Um, and ultimately, they are they are connected up to relays uh, and, and solenoid uh, nozzles on the boom. And as you can see, this this weed here has been hit because it's been detected as a as a green uh, pixel in the video frame. Um, 
the modular nature uh, of, of the system also allows user allows users to potentially add in their own algorithms uh, to, to tweak the sensitiv sensitivity of those algorithms to their own forms. Um, they can also employ different computers or cameras in the future uh, as technology develops. Um, and they could also use different weak control methods as well. So rather than using uh, solenoids, they could, for instance, use targeted tillage uh, or, or other targeted uh, methods um, down the track. Um, we, we have been using uh, the owl uh, on, on the farm at the Plant Breeding Institute up in Narrabri. Um, up there, we, uh, we mounted a two meter boom with two owl units. You can see them here. Uh, onto the back of the Agaris digital farmhand robot um, as part of the DigiFarm project. Um, and look, we fused that to both spray fallow uh, and fence lines on the property there. And uh, we really have realized uh, pr pretty large savings in terms of chemical usage uh, in, in those instances. Um, and and the other funny thing uh, that, that one of our colleagues did up there, we, we had some chickpea plots that needed to be sprayed with fungicide. Um, and we, we thought it would just effectively act as a blanket sprayer uh, it, it, when we filled, uh, filled up our tank with fungicide and went to spray our chickpeas. Um, but there were some patchy spots in the chickpea canopy. And, and so ultimately that resulted in us using less fungicide than we would have used uh, if, if we had just used uh, a blanket spray of fungicide across them as well. Uh, so the, there's other uses of the owl as well. Um, I, we, we do have a video of the owl in action in Narbri. Um, however, due to internet issues, uh, I thought I'd better just post a link to it here. Um, and, and these links will be on the final side of the presentation as well, if you, if you would like to check out the video of the owl in action. Um, in our publication here, uh, we validated the baseline efficacy of, of the system in, uh, on, on properties in southern New South Wales and at the Plant Breeding Institute of Cobbity. Uh, in, in this case, we were testing uh, four commonly used algorithms, so they're already well established. Uh, color-based algorithms for, uh, for plant detection. Um, and the first of these is called XS Green. Uh, the, the second is a, a normalized XS Green. Uh, I guess what, what that refers to is if, if there isn't much green in the, uh, in the frame, it will look for more green. Uh, we also use a hue saturation value as technique to, to look for green pixels. And uh, we also added a, our own sort of composite uh, XG and, and HSV algorithm there as well. Um, and we tested these by, uh, by choosing the algorithm and then walking with this uh, video recording stick, uh, which, which also runs on a Raspberry Pi in the OWL software. Um, and, and this is me on a farm uh, down in Wagga. Um, and we would just walk 50 meter, a 50 meter transect with the system pointing straight down. And then we would analyze the performance. Uh, so look at how many weeds were actually detected once we got back to, uh, back to the lab in Sydney. Um, and overall, we were pretty happy with the performance uh, across the uh, seven uh, transects that we recorded. Uh, and ac across the uh, four different algorithms, we had a mean precision of about 79%. Um, which, which means we were picking up about uh, uh, all, all the detections that the, the owl made, uh, 79 of those were in fact true weeds. Um, and the main recall, uh, so how many weeds uh, that were actually there were, were we detecting, uh, we got about 52% recall there. Um, the good news was that in one of the um, transects uh, with the XG algorithm, we, we got a, a precision of 92% and 72% for recall. So uh, the potential is definitely there for us to improve this further. Um, and certainly we, we saw very good performance where we had large weeds. Um, they, they were not a problem at all. Uh, and also smaller, very green weeds um, were, were fine as well. Um, and, and also situations where we had a nice, uh, nice dark background that the weeds stood out against uh, was also uh, fairly recorded good, good performance. Where we had less good performance and, and where we could make improvements is where we were seeing uh, smaller weeds. 
um, and uh, I guess discoloured weeds as well, particularly purple uh, browning weeds were, were not picked up as well. Uh, we had some problems in bright, really reflective stubble, uh, so canola in particular was, was quite troublesome. We, it, it was, was picking up some of these reflections as false positives. Um, so detecting a weed where, where in actual fact it's just a bright reflection um, and also under poor lighting. So, so the nighttime uh, detections were, were certainly not as good uh, because it was just a bit darker and we had some blur, uh, which, which was meaning that the system wasn't picking up the weeds as effectively there. Um, so I guess moving forward from here, uh, we are looking to improve the functionality um, of the system. Uh, we're, we're sort of always keen to improve on what we've done. We, we really see the OWL as a, as a community resource now. And, uh, and this is where the agricultural community comes in and sort of engages with us and, and works together with us to, uh, to push this forward to something that can really be useful. Um, for the community. And the main way we're going to do that is through our GitHub repository. And this is essentially a website where we have all of the code um, uh, available to download. Uh, this is completely free and, and open to use. Uh, we also have very comprehensive step-by-step uh, -step guides on how to build an owl yourself, um, how to install the software. Uh, we have a, a quick method uh, and, and a, a sort of longer method, which would allow you to actually learn how such a system goes together uh, on the software side of things. Um, and, and so, yeah, if, you, if you're if you interested in that, again, we've got the link down here and the QR code. Um, what we also have on there are some discussion boards for people to engage with, with other users of OWL. Uh, you can uh, log issues. So if there are things that you realize aren't working particularly well, then you're able to log an issue there. Um, and, and we can get around to looking into fixing that as, as they come in. Um, we have already had quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of good quality feedback through other social media platforms, in particular Twitter. Um, and I, in fact, I know that Dale has, uh, Dale Kirby and uh, Bill have been building uh, some OWL systems at uh, uh, LLS. Um, but, but we also have some other people uh, on Twitter here, including one of our honor students at Sydney who, who have been built uh, over the past few months. Um, we also have some people on Twitter, uh, uh, oh, sorry, on GitHub from overseas. Uh, so this is a user from Canada who, who saw an opportunity to uh, improve on the uh, 3D printed enclosure that we had been we had designed um, to be able to work with a more powerful computing platform. Uh, in this case, the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, uh, which which has a graphics card. Um, and I guess that, that moves us on to the next step uh, in, in what we think could be improved. Uh, so, so when we set out to build this system, we, we really did think that cost was a major barrier for people adopting such a system. Um, and so we went with the lowest cost uh, components that we could find. Uh, but now we, we, we're looking at how to improve things and certainly computing uh, power is, is one of the issues that we think uh, could, could be addressed quite easily, and so uh, and and that was also identified by by this user in Canada. Um, I also mentioned the fact that our cameras were were certainly not performing very well in darker situations, and so we uh, we could potentially shift to using better cameras in the next iteration of power as well. Um, and and finally, uh, I guess for us to really move into uh, green on green detection, so uh, detecting weeds when there is also a crop present in the field, uh, we really need to shift to using uh, sort of more much more complicated algorithms where we use machine learning and deep learning techniques to to detect those weeds uh, from from the camera. And uh, ultimately, that's all going to depend on good quality image data. And uh, I guess that just brings me to my final point, uh, and, and I guess a little advertisement for uh, one of the other projects that our group has been working on together with the Sydney Informatics Hub, um, and that is the Weed AI database. Uh, so this this was set up uh, as, as an open source uh, repository for uh, annotated weed images that could then be used for training uh, complex machine learning models. 
Um, and so if you'd like to check it out, again, we have a link down the bottom here. Uh, you're welcome to, to have a look at the data that's already there. Uh, and, and we're certainly keen for people to be uploading their own data to that, um, to that repository as well. And uh, with that, I'd just like to thank my colleagues uh, in the University of Sydney research team, uh, both in Camden and up in Narrabri, uh, to the Australian Centre for Field Robotics for their uh, assistance with the digital farmhand robot up in Narrabri, to the Informatics Hub at Sydney Uni uh, for their help with the Weed AI system and, and their in maintaining and, and developing that system further. Uh, to the growers of New South Wales for allowing us to test owl on their on our farms. Uh, to the growing owl community, uh, hopefully continuing to grow over the next little while. Um, and of course, to our funders, the GRDC, and uh, to uh, the National Land Care Programme Smart Farming Partnerships. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank you for listening and, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk today. Right, yeah. Thanks for that. I'm just wondering if you have any information on what's become of the weed chipper. Is there? I thought um, that had a role. Um, some people yeah, in the field um, that I went to didn't seem that impressed, but I thought it had a role. I just wonder, yeah, where that is at the moment. Yeah, uh, the weed chipper certainly still exists, um, and uh, I guess we we could potentially use it with a system such as our uh, for targeted tillage. Um, it's definitely still there, and, and yeah, it's uh, it's ready to be used forever. I mean, look at the end of the day, uh, herbicide resistance isn't going to be an issue that's resolved by continuing to use herbicides. Uh, so our group is very much looking at alternate weed control technologies as well, um, including tillage, but also uh, lasers and electricity as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any insight into why perhaps people? Are a bit resistant to the weed chipper and that concept. Is it? Is it just they don't want to go um, back to tillage, or they just want something easier? They want an easy answer, or yeah. look. I think uh, I think with any new technology, Bill, it's uh, it's it's it, it's just difficult to sh to shift out of old habits, and uh, we've certainly become very reliant on chemical use in agriculture and. and Shifting away from that is is certainly going to take some some doing, um, but but yeah, hopefully it will, it, hopefully all it will take is is a few sort of pioneers to uh, to shift to these new technologies and and that will uh, spread from there. Um, that's certainly what we want with the owl, um, yeah, for it to spread by word of mouth and then it will develop further from. Okay, thanks for that. Um... Yes, okay, and Michael Walsh has just said that at the moment there's no commercial prov provider for the wheat chipper yet. Emphasis on the word yet, yep. Okay, um, we'll move on to our final speaker, who is uh, Darren Marshall, who is the General Manager of Southern Queensland Landscapes. Um, they're a community-owned organisation, and they assist landholders with... Uh, profitable and sustainable food and fibre production. He's going to talk about uh, pig collaring, um, certainly on the Liverpool Plains, pigs have become a big problem in cropping. So I'll hand over to Darren and he might have some insights on what we can do about them. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, I we can, Darren. Can. Oh, yes, good. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, I'd just like to talk about feral pigs and and mainly it's mainly about busting myths. There's so many beliefs out there about where pigs go, what they do, how much impact they have on different resources, and then those myths and beliefs turn into how people control those animals. So I guess what we're trying to do is get the truth out there. So, you know, while we try to use this technology of, um, of collars and showing ex people exactly where the pigs go, the biggest challenge for us is, is the people and getting people to work together. Um, you know, it's not hard to motivate people that are doing a lot of cropping to control feral pigs, but if their neighbours aren't doing it, then it is quite hard to motivate them. So, so, you know, we need to look at ways that we can get people interested in doing the pig control and tell them the truth about what's going on. 
So it, it's no secret, you know, there's 100 pigs up there on the screen and to have any impact on those pigs, you've got to take out 75% of them within a certain period of time, within about three months. And, and effectively what happens is that doesn't happen. You know, people get out a few hunters, they do a, they do a bit of trapping, they, they do all of these different types of control measures, but it doesn't actually control the feral pigs. It doesn't, um, it doesn't take enough of them out. So we need to work out how we can get people motivated to implement the methods that actually do have the impact. And in that open cropping country, you know, it's those first two, it's baiting and aerial shooting. You just can't get the, the 75% knockdown that you need with the, with the rest of those methods. Not that they don't play a role, but those top two are the ones that we need to really, really work on. And so, you know, when you do get people motivated to do this, we need to, we need to give, them, give them good information. We need to rally the troops, get them to work together, get them to, to actually control the feral pigs in, in the correct way and not just put out a little bit of bait and, and think they're doing it or implement a few traps to actually get it done properly. Um, participation, how do you get the coordinated attack going? How do you get everybody to do it? And then for me, it's the intelligence. Where are the pigs going? Where are they most vulnerable in the landscape? And therefore, where do we implement the control measures? It's freezing up on me. This is why you didn't put movies in your thing, William. So the question comes down to, can I use these collars to motivate people to do this work at a landscape scale? Landholders can do as much as they want on their own properties, but you know we need to get this at a landscape scale so we actually reduce the numbers and the impact that they have. So we need to have the, we need to have the local buy-in. We need to learn from the landholders as much as they learn from us, and we need to give them back really good information that's useful for them so that they will use it and they will control it. And it just amazes me how little distance you've got to go from a project site before the landholder's perception is it's different here. It's different here, Darren. The pigs don't move like they do there. And, and, and you know, things happen different in our area. So, you know, we need to come back with that truth, respect the information that they've got, and then build the plan with them. So effectively, we try to get representative pigs from the landscape. And, um, and we want big boars, little boars, big sows, little sows. We want to know where everything's moving. And it's ideal to have 30 collars out in, in any one sort of location, any one area. What we do is we, we use a drug called Zolotil and that knocks the pigs out. If you don't knock the pigs out, you can't get the collars on, on firm enough because they sort of swell up. It's, it, it knocks them out pretty quick. It's only a couple of minutes and, and those pigs will hit the deck in the trap and then you can start to work on them. Um, it, it's a tricky drug to use, I guess. You've got to keep them cool. You don't want them to heat up too much and you want them knocked out enough that you can do all the work you need. So we obviously take DNA samples, we put ear tags in them so that if any hunters or anyone does get the feral pig, hopefully they'll come back with our collar. And then we just take a whole heap of measurements, their weights, their length, all that sort of stuff, just to see how much they grow over the time that they're collared. And it's just amazing how pigs change in a very short time. There's a collar going on there. It looks pretty firm. But you'll see here that you've got to be able to get your fingers underneath that collar and there's a fair bit of play there. It's their jaw and their ear that keeps that on and then you need to collect data or all the data that you can off that animal. Effectively, pigs don't have sweat glands, so they can't cool down. So you've got to keep them really cool or they overheat with that drug. Now, that pig's off now. He'll, he'll wake up and go away. And those collars are set to take a GPS point every 30 minutes. And then those GPS points go up to the satellite every six hours. So we can get current data um, every six hours off that animal. If we're implementing an aerial shoot or something like that, what we do is increase it to every five minutes so that we can actually see where the pigs go in conjunction to where the helicopter flies. Which pigs get shot? Is it the ones that run or the ones that stay still? So, you know, we're hopefully improving those techniques for, um, for those people wanting to implement those control measures. This is six pigs based out at the, at the research farm at, at the moment. 
Um, effectively, we've got pigs out there now and we're continuing to keep them collared for hopefully an, another 12 months. There's only six there, there's 10 all up, but that just gives you an idea of the raw data for the people that know that area. That's just the raw data of some of those animals that are moving around in that area. And it um, always amazes me how, how, how far they don't go. You know, they, they're not like dingoes, they're not like dogs, they don't cover a whole heap of country. They really do stick to their stick to their ranges and their, their food, water and shelter. So there's some raw data. That raw data doesn't tell us much. We're, we're moving away from the Narrabri site now because we haven't collected all the data back to analyse it. But this now shows you from another site what, what you can do with that data. And, and most of it is about getting people involved and getting people to, to participate in coordinated control. So that's the raw data. That just tells you where the pigs moved. If you put a heat map over it, you can soon see there that if you wanted to target that pig, and if he is representative of, of lots of pigs in that area because they all hang out together and are gregarious, you can see there there's three spots, you know, where, where that heat map really shows that those groups of pigs are really hanging out. So if you target your control measures in those areas, that should really increase the effectiveness of the control. This next map shows the seasonal data. And this one often amazes me, especially if you talk to helicopter pilots. They say, oh, we know this area, Darren, we know where to fly. We fly the same place and we, and we always get the pigs in the same areas. But yet, if you look at this data, you can see orange is autumn, green is winter, yellow is spring, and red is summer. So if you implemented a control program in the autumn over these, this area, you'd really have a, a good impact. And then human nature is you would want to go back there, implement, implement the control there again any other season of the year because you've had success. But that data shows there that unless it's autumn, you won't have the impact that you want. So that's also good data to give back to those landholders to show where the pigs might be most vulnerable at different times of the year. Um, this map here, I think it, it's really effective just in the engagement point of view. I mean, you get a group of 10 or 12 landholders in the room, each different scribble there is a different pig moving around in, in time from 2017 up until now, pretty much. And, you know, it really does show landholders who's got the problem. So, you know, they don't all live in the national park and come walk 50 kilometres a night to come and hit the crop and then go all back to the park. You know, it's really powerful to show people this and dispel the myths about where pigs go and what they actually do. You put that slide up and it, it's hard to get off it. You've got to watch it a couple of times with the, with the group usually because they're really interested just to see who's got the pigs and, um, and where they're actually going. Then if you want to zoom in a bit more here, this, is, this shows the core home range and the home range of, of a 77 kilo boar in red and a 40 kilo sow in sort of that pinky colour. And you can see the home range is the, is the green polygon and that feral pig spends 90% of his time within that home range. But then you can see the little yellow circles, that's his core home range. So half of his time is spent within each of those little little yellow points. So you need, you need to ground truth that and work out what it is because again, that's where you can really target your control measures. So if, if one of those little circles is a dead beast, you know, it's, it's not effective because the dead beast is not always gonna be there. But if it's a, a spring and it's really overgrown and people never really go there, which is often what it is, um, you know, that pig feels safe there, he feels secure there. And so he keeps going back to that area and if we can implement the control measures in that core home range, hopefully we get a much better impact. So that's where you put your traps or that's where you free feed to do your baiting or they're the GPS points you give the helicopter pilot to go and target first because we think the pigs will probably be there. Um, this final slide, it's, it's just to show that it's everybody's problem. I mean, that's only, that's only one pig, but you'll always get especially between the croppers and the graziers, you'll always get, oh, the pigs aren't really on our place. They're always, they're always on our mate's place that's got the crop. Um, and for anyone knows that, that's the Arcadia Valley and there's only one of those squares that has crop. And, the, and those landholders truly believe that those pigs would really hammer and hit hard just on one of those properties there. But that shows that over that period of time, almost everyone in the valley had that pig at least at some stage. So again, it's about dispelling those myths and, um, and moving ahead.
moving ahead with how to implement the control measures better. I think just to finish up the, the future, it's really challenging for us at the moment because what we're finding is because we collar these animals, we know how they survive a control measure. I said at the start, you've got to take out 75% um, of the population. And even with aerial shoots in some country, we're finding that we're only getting that 30 or 40%. And so how do we, how do we give that data back to the people that are controlling these animals and not be offensive. You know, the last thing we want is people not to do aerial shooting because it's not showing that it's taking out enough pigs when really it's one of the most effective tools. So the future for us is potentially using better monitoring techniques on the ground to monitor the population, whether it's with, um, with remote cameras or aerial surveys. And then the new stuff that's coming out is thermal surveys. And the thermal surveys work so well because feral pigs run at a lot hotter temperature than most other animals. So they're easy to pick up. And then on top of that, I guess, is the thermally assisted aerial shooting to see if that's a good enough measure. Mate, I think I can stop at that. If there are any questions, I'm good to go. Sounds to me, Pigs are a bit like noxious weeds. They always come from somewhere, somebody else's property. <laughs> and the collar dispels that myth really quick. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. We don't have any uh, questions up there at the moment. Uh, I do have a comment from a previous... Um, previous presentation, and it does uh, point to uh, an interview with uh, the Minister on connectivity, internet connect connectivity in the bush. So some people might like to have a look at that. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, we might leave it there. And uh, I would ask, we do have a survey, do we, Christy, for people to fill out? And the questionnaire is coming up on my screen now. So if you could please fill that out. I'm just not exactly sure how many questions we have. Christy, can you fill us in on that? Uh, there's only one on the poll, um, Bill. The other question that we wanted you asked at the start was if people had additional topics they wanted covered, if yes. they can let us know so that we can incorporate those. Um, unfortunately, through Zoom, I can't do an open-ended question. So um, that's why we have it in that format. Fair enough. Yeah. So if there's anything else you want to hear about it, please pop it into the chat now. And probably at this point, we can uh, declare the webinar done, although I'm sure we'll leave it open for a few minutes just to see if there are any more comments in the chat section. Okay, well, thanks everybody who participated. And I think at this point, we'll uh, declare the webinar, webinar over. And I think there is another webinar coming up on the 22nd, on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, um, looking at livestock issues. Thanks very much. <laughs>